We're going back to the series we began last week that we titled Pursuing God and, her, and what? His purposes. I will quickly run over it. I uh, told us last week that I felt that in year 2024, at the end of the last year, 2023, that I feel that one way that we are seen to prosper in the rapidly changing landscape of this uh, world is to invest in the pursuit of God and his purposes. And I told us the reason why, that the only one way that we will not be moved with the landscapes that are moving here and there is to invest in God and his purpose, because that is what will guarantee our victory. And I also warned us that knowing this is not enough, but we must make every effort. We must ascertain that as saints, we are holding on to or standing on a ground that will not be moved. Because one of the things that is going to happen in this year is that there is going to be a shaking, a more intense shaking, because the shaking has already begun. And I told us of the fact that the ability to stand firm on the ground is to have a proper position. And you see, like we were singing this morning, we sang about the position in Christ, the solid rock. And we, we, I told you that we have to be very careful to evaluate the position because there are fake grounds. There are grounds that give you this uh, perceived state of uh Safety, but it is not the proper ground. I also told us, secondly, that we must be careful that our hearts are not divided. Because once the heart is divided, in the middle of shaking, our perspective of God changes also. It, become, it becomes skewed, and we begin to perceive and think of the things that God has not done. And when this happens, I told us that we are in the danger of being exposed to cynicism, a mockery, and that we must avoid anything that will provoke cynicism and mockery because what cynicism and mockery do to the saint is eventually it helps the saint's heart to be hardened. And once you get to this place of hardening, I told you that it's a very fearful position to be just because once you are hardened, one of the things that you push out of your life is the only help. The only thing, person, forgive is not a thing, that can help you is the person of the Holy Spirit. Once we harden ourselves, then we expose ourselves to a very dangerous position. I also talk, told us that the idea of shaking is not an evil thing per se. That the idea is that God is ready to separate the tares from the weed or the wheat. He's ready to separate the weed from the crop. He's ready to put a clear delineation between light and darkness. And to do that, he would use the purging to the, the shaking to purge us of what? Unnecessary weight. Because sometimes we think we are carrying the proper weight. We think we are doing what we need to do. Whereas the problem is we are carrying on due weight. And I said to us, we must be very careful in this season to be, to be sure that we are investing in the right places. Because this proper investment will guarantee us surviving through the shaking. And I said one of the things that the shaking does that is that it goes to the root of our investments. Every shaking goes to the root of the investment. So if the investment is wrong, and you've invested in these big and lofty ideas, and shaking comes and touches their roots, it fizzles. And you'll be very much what disappointed. And I said that that is what will lead a lot of saints to despair, to discouragement, to hate, to bitterness towards God. And if a person is not careful, they could fall. 
And that led us to a very important question for today, which I kind of hinted last week. And the question is, we should ask ourselves, why should iniquity increase or the increase in, in iniquity cause us to be discouraged? Why should the increase in iniquity cause us to be discouraged? Because that is what Jesus said in Matthew 24. I will read from verse 12. It says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow. It is a very sobering phrase. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. I trepidate in my heart because everything that comes out of the mouth of God is true. They are yea, they are amen. They don't, they don't come with, oh, God is going to change you tomorrow. Christ will never lie because it's not like us. God will never lie because it's not a man. But hear what this scripture says here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. It could have been the love of many. That's tolerable. Because when he says many, it could be maybe a certain percentage in a big percentage, in a big number. But what this is saying is that the larger percentage of a number of people who once believed and loved God will lose their love and their love will become cold. In the King James Version and in the root word, the idea is that there, there is a wax that has been subject to heat and started to melt and become liquid because of the presence of that heat. And basically, it talks about a, a joy, a relationship that is alive and bubbly. But suddenly, because of the increase in wickedness, that heat started to recede, and slowly the wax that was liquid became solid. Guys, it is good when the God, the Lord, opens your eyes about His Word. Do you know why that particular scripture was used that way? When is it easy? Ah, or easier? Those of you who did art or pottery and, and all. When is it easier to manipulate clay? Is it when it is hard or when it is still soft? I can hear you. When it is soft, guys, follow that scripture. When is it easy to mold wax into a shape? Is it when it is liquid or when it is harder? When it is liquid, because you make a matrix and pour it. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. That at this particular point, the saint would no longer be malleable in the hands of God. The spirit can no longer lead them to the water of life. They can no longer hear God because they are so hardened and they cannot be torn to enter the cove, the cleft that Jesus Christ is. Can you guys see what that scripture is saying? Because oftentimes we just read it, we run over it. They under, the scripture understood why it, he used that word wax that is now becoming cold. Because once it gets cold, it becomes a solid structure. And you could become solid in the wrong position. But hear what the scripture is saying here. The scripture in the first part of this statement did not say that the the wickedness of saints will increase. I also want you to see that. He didn't say that here. He just says, because of the increase in wickedness, right? The love of most that, that are saints will grow cold. It means that because of the things that are happening around us, in the world, in the church, the love of most saints will become cold. 
it's a very terrible place to be. That my act, their act, will hinder my faithfulness to God. It is scary. And, and, and this does not exonerate me. That the sins of the world and the trouble and the things that are going on made me to slide back. You know, it's the place where a lot of saints are. Well, my faith would have been stronger. It's because of Pastor Tony. Oh, I would have been a great lover of God it's because of what my parents did. Oh, it's because my father didn't give me a good example. That's why I'm unable to be a good husband and a good man. But what you don't understand is that you will still face the consequence of the state of your heart. Are you guys still following me? It is important when you go back and read that scripture to know that when Jesus said this, he is not saying we cannot avoid it. Because verse 13 says, it says, but the one who does what? Stands firm to the end will be what? You don't know the scripture. Saved. Let's read it together. Verse 13. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Are you following me? Christ is saying most people will get cold, but those who purposefully stand firm will be saved. You will be spared the despair, the discouragement. So Christ is not saying that the church will fall. He's basically saying this is what is going to be happening, but those who stand on me, the rock that never changes, that never fails, they will be saved. Are you still with me? And so we need now to go to the question because it is easier to answer the question if we understood the passage. Because of the increase in iniquity and the way iniquity works, it goes to the foundations of things and anything that is not grounded will be swept off. Are you still with me? You know, people can do the talk but the act, you can't fake it. You can go through school. If the school doesn't go through you, when push comes to shove, you'll be a fake professional. That's what iniquity is talking about. And so I want you all to see that iniquity goes to the foundation of things. And anything that iniquity finds that is not well grounded will be swept off. So if the bulk of the investment of a saint is not fully rooted in Christ, Paul says fully rooted in Christ, then the shakings that will come will uproot our investment and it will be ruined. So I need you to ask, ask yourself this question or answer me inside your heart. What is the core of your investment? Is it gold? Is it diamond? Is it silver? Is it bronze? Is it rock? Is it wood? Is it hay? Because the shaking will go to the essence of what you have invested, and it will tell you what you have invested. So now you can answer the question. When your investment is lost, then you are at a loss. You will be disappointed. This is what will afflict the love of most people and saints. Guys, can you imagine pursuing God for 60 years? You think you love God. You think you're doing everything well. You've sacrificed. You think you've sacrificed. And then iniquity starts to grow. Then you are thinking, where's God in this? Where's God in this? Maybe it's only for a few days. Where is God in this? And at the end of the day, you're like, I doubt God is in it. I think I have believed nothing. And the reason you get to that spot is because your belief was not grounded. Your sacrifices were not grounded upon Jesus Christ. One of the things about blessings is this. Blessings are great. God, I want to be blessed. I want to prosper. 
I want to be prosperous. But the problem is that we could become so used to prosperity and equate that as a right standard of Christian living. Because hear this, the richest people in the earth are not Christians. They are not Christians. They are prospering. They have everything. So I want you to know that it is so important for you to be careful not to equate prosperity as being well and okay with God. The people who have the money of the world, the influence, the prosperity of the world, they don't know who God is. They don't care about God. And so I cannot equate that as being the proper investment. The proper investment is to invest in God and his purposes. And so I believe the place to begin is to stop and evaluate self and check my investment. What is driving me? What is behind me? What is the fire that is driving my passion? What makes my heart beat? What is in my investment portfolio? I used to be uh, the director of a youth ministry in a very large church in the, in the, in the past in Africa. And uh, one of the things that I found out is that there were a category of young ladies Forgive me, Jesus. We used to call them old layers because they couldn't get husband at the right time. And we saved behind them. And they, they were very fervent. They were very fervent. They pray, they fast. When it's time to serve, they do. And But then you realize that the moment they get that husband, it's finished. This is not even teasing them. The moment they lay hand on that husband, that's the reason they were investing. And so when trouble comes, they are the type that jump from church to church, from prophet to prophet, and preacher to preacher. Men, there are, men do that too. They are waiting for breakthrough. The moment they get their first million, the investment has ended. So what I'm trying to say is that, except you've taken time to evaluate the core of your investment, you could be severely discouraged. There is a litmus test. Litmus is like a, a, a certain material that you use to test whether acidity or basis or whatever of a substance. You, it will tell you if something is acid, it will tell you if it's base, and you can do some other trick with it. So the, the, your litmus test should be like this. Do your investment live through you? Or do you live through your investments? You, you must be able to answer that question. Are you living for your investment? Or your investment exists only because you are already alive in Christ? Can you answer that question? It is a very important test. Your health, your wealth, your comfort, your freedom, and even your survival, are they the reason for your life? Or all of these things, they try because you live. Somebody sang a song, he says, because he lives. What can I do? I can face what? Tomorrow. Or should I say, I face tomorrow because I am so rich. Because you've got to answer that question. Sometimes we don't like to say that because if I tell Pastor Tony, I'm just so happy. I love God because I have millions. Oh, I'm living because I have millions. Pastor Tony is going to say, come, I need to preach to you. Maybe you should let me preach to you. The millions are good because if you reach, then I probably can get some from you. But the key is don't live through the eyes of those things. You, and it's a thing that you and I must be willing to look at. But the factor is this. All of these things that I mentioned, they are the basic foundations of human needs. It's not a crime to have them. So there are four things that constitute the basic needs of humans in life. And when these things are in place, we usually consider ourselves satisfied. 
Basically, nobody should miss any of these four basic things. Nobody on earth is avoiding it. Even the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody. Let me start. Number one, survival, our life. Number two, our appetite. Number three, our relevance. Number four, our freedom. I'll quickly go through each of these for you to see why this is important. Our survival, although, hear this, everyone talks about going to heaven. Let's see, who wants to go to heaven? Hallelujah. Is there, is there a hand that is not lifted? Okay, let's see. Who wants to die? I don't seem to see any hand. <laughs> but but that, that is the reality. Nobody wants to die. Let me tell you a very funny story and then we'll continue with our teaching today. One year we were in, uh, in Africa, in the country of Benin, and we were coming from one of the church, church plants. And we noticed a, 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 a woman by the side of the road, or a child, I don't know. We saw, I saw, so the driver saw her also, a, a woman, and we knew she was going to try and cross. So she entered the road and went back. And the driver knew and slowed down. And then she stood as if she was not going to cross. Somehow, either she misjudged or something is happening in her brain just as the driver stepped on the pedal, she entered into the road. I thought we were on top of her with the truck. I thought she was dead. We almost somersaulted because the driver did all those maneuver to avoid her. I day was barely a year or two. Okay. Uh, okay, something there. And then finally when the dust settled, Everybody jumped down. We were looking for the woman. Where is she? Somehow she escaped. And we were about to enter the car. I just said, Dad, are we in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, 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 and it was funny because the spirit was saying, say the faith of a child. You know? I'm like, what kind of a question is that in my mind? But it was a pertinent question. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody really wants to die. So the way we pray, you can see it. The security we have in our homes, the city we choose to live in, the cars we drive, the reason we choose where we do missions or we do not do missions, they are all tied to the fact that we do not want to make the choices that will expose us to death. Even when we want to go to the hospital, we choose the better doctor because we don't want somebody who's going to butcher us. So I would like to say this, that it is not a wrong thing to desire to be alive. It is not wrong. Here, even the psalmist understood this. Psalm 118 verse 17 says, I shall not die. Can you complete it? But live and what? And declare the works of the Lord. The psalmist understood. And in the same way, David said it in Psalm 115, verse 17. He said to the Lord, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. I believe that the Lord put the desire in man not to want to die. He put it there. That's why he, he put the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Had we chosen that, maybe things would be different today. God does not want us to die. The reason is this. Death breaks the continuity of whatever pleasures of life we might have been enjoying. That's what death does. That's why everybody is very scared of it. It is a final thing to the pleasure of the moment. The scriptures talk of the fact that God has put a desire for eternity in the hearts of men. And this is because death brings an end to what we already have. It is a scary thing. 
Here, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet, no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Hear me. I said that there are four important factors that every human being needs. The first part of it is life. You have to have life. And even because if you don't have life, how can you praise God? How can you worship God? So we all need life. It's a very important factor. Number two factor is appetite. Most of our efforts, apart from what is done for enlarging the kingdom of God, are designed to meet what? What? Our appetite. You build a 100-story building. You make a trillion dollars. You give some to the state. At the end of the day, it comes down to being able to buy steak, chicken, grocery, and enjoy. It's appetite. Everything we do, it comes down to that. No matter how much you give to the kingdom, whatever is left, is you're not going to keep the money in the bank and just say, oh, wow, I've got a trillion dollars and you don't eat. It's not true. It is designed to satisfy your appetite. Whether it is for our stomach or our body, all of these are geared towards meeting our appetites. And see how the Lord made a reference to this appetite. In Matthew 6, 27, 26 to 27, it says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? food, and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you, not much more valuable than they. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? So the Lord knows that, yes, we need to fulfill this appetite. He understood that the things that humans toil for to fill our appetite, he understood it. Again, I want to say this. There is nothing wrong wanting to take care of my appetite. What did the scripture say? It says, a man who does not provide for the needs of his family is worse than who? An infidel. And, and, and that is why the Lord said, we should not worry because why? Already God knows our what? Our needs. And he has already made provisions to meet them. Factor number two, right? We've dealt with what? Our life, our appetite. Let's go to factor number three. This one is interesting. Relevance. I have never seen people. There, uh, there are people but there are very few people in this world who are, in reality, humble. It's not a lie. There are very few people who truly are humble. The way you find out is that just make a man feel less than he is. Then you will see whether they are humble or not. Make a woman feel irrelevant. Scorn her. And then you will see trouble. They could be the best, the sweetest people. Just con her. Then you will know you have crossed the red line. Most people will not be happy if they were ignored or their glory was in any way tampered with. Most people won't. And this is why you will find that people will not take it lightly if they were rejected. Isn't it all over the world? When you reject somebody, whether legal or not legal, you have started trouble for yourself. Some might even go to any length to prove that they were relevant. Some who cannot take it will resort to emotional death. I see it in marriages. They've been rejected. The woman is like, okay, I'm afraid to physically kill myself, but they die emotionally. They die emotionally. Some men, they die emotionally because their wives have refused to give them what they look they are looking for 
People resort to destructive behaviors to compensate for being rejected. Some even end their lives. You know what? I wondered why people care if someone rejected you or even humiliated you. Why do you care? You know why? It is because God puts that thing in us. And I can tell you guys today, there is nobody who is a superstar who says, I don't care. Everybody cares. The reason is that foundationally, the way God designed us, we were designed to care. Let me, let me show you from the scripture. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 27, hear this. God said, let us make man in the image of animals. Is that what it says? It says, let us make man, how? In our image, in our likeness, so that they will rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The idea that we are in the image and likeness of God is what provokes this. Because your person, your inner person tells you, you are valuable. You are something. And when somebody tries to cut that low, your soul knows that they are lying, that they are being aggressive, that they are being violent at you. And that's why you barely find people who can tolerate it when they are rejected and made to feel irrelevant. I think few people who really succeeded were the people like the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible testified about Moses. He said he was the most humble man on earth. But you know, when I look at it, 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 it didn't really go well because at the end of the day, some people got swallowed for being rude to Moses. So again, what am I saying? The third factor of life, it is okay to want to be relevant. It is okay. It is not a crime. God put it in you. The fourth is freedom. This is one basic human need that almost no human being want to compromise. Americans will go and bomb your country if you try to steal their freedom. They will bomb you to ashes. <laughs> People will kill if they can. Even when you have slaves, they will, in their hearts, they will try to kill the slave's master because they, that idea of freedom just becomes impossible to compromise. Whatever the nature of the freedom is, man was created to be free. And that is why he was not designed as a robot. He was given a free will. So for those of us who always ask the question, why did God have to let man choose? Well, it's because God made you free from the beginning. That's why God did not restrict Adam and Eve. God knew they were going there. He saw them before they touched him. He could have set a little bit of bolt or fire you know, onto the fruit so they would be shocked. But that freedom was not compromisable. In Genesis chapter 2, hear what the Lord says. Verse 15 says, The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to walk it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good. He even gave them freedom to choose. He says, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. This is what I want to say. All these four factors are extremely important. And you know, good things adapt you to them. A good relationship, you suddenly fall in love with a guy. Before you know it, you cannot do without him. But you always forget that there was a time when you were single. That's because the relationship is so good, you become adapted to them. Paul even said it. He said, for freedom's sake, did Christ die. Christ died for us to have freedom. So, guys, I have probably spoken what looks like philosophy. And so the question you would then is, okay, 
what are you trying to get to? What is it that I'm trying to get to? This is what I'm trying to get to. When these four factors that I have discussed with you are affected by iniquity, <laughs> our love will get cold. If we have not found a way to build ourselves upon the rock that is Christ. That's the real problem here. These factors have everything to do with what we do, except we understand that these factors don't mean that when they disappear in our lives, we are not saved. If for you, your freedom disappears, your relevance disappears, your life disappears, or is in danger of disappearing, and you start to become angry, then you are in danger. The only way to overcome when these four basic factors of life are afflicted is to already be grounded in Christ. We know men will go to any length to get this, and it's going to happen very soon. What will you do if all the cash that you put in the bank suddenly becomes devalued? What will you do? If that's what has been keeping you going, what will you do? What will you do if the doctor suddenly says, you know, this disease has only a lifespan of five years, you're going to die? What will you do? What will you do if somebody suddenly starts a, a, an attack upon your nation that restricts your movement? What will you do? Because as a saint, we expect God to help us to sustain those factors in our lives. And Jesus said it. He says, when this iniquity comes, it will cause our love to wax cold because iniquity will go to the very root of the very important factors of our lives. And that is why those who are not already grounded in Jesus Christ are in the danger of falling cold in their love. Do you know why men commit idolatry? These four factors. There are people who will sign off their soul for the devil to be relevant. There are people who will give up anything to eat. There are people who will sacrifice their souls to be free. There are people who will give everything to deal with these four factors because they have adapted to them. And this is one big reason for discouragement. You feel it. You've managed to buy a car. You barely can pay your bills every month. And then the engine breaks. And then you say, but Lord, I pay my tithes. I do my offering. I go to church. I am not an adulterer. Why me? Except you understand that the nature of this factor is not supposed to be the end game for you. They are just there as instruments to serve you. If you do not, then discouragement, hate, and bitterness will take place. And when you are put in the situations like this, you see, one of the worst situations that men hate is not to be in control. Is there somebody who doesn't like to be in control? And so, But when iniquity comes, that is what it will take away. It will take away your, 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 your feeling of feeling safe, of feeling free, of having food, of being able to make those choices. It will take it away. But literally, this is what I want you to hear me. He does not take it away. Do you know why? These four important factors... They are transient in nature. What does the word transient mean? Do you guys know what that means? They are what? They pass away. They are not fixed. They will pass away. Money will pass. Food will pass. 
life will pass. Freedom will pass. And if a person builds their foundation only upon those things, then they have a problem. So how does a saint escape for his love not to wax cold? It is simple. By already being crucified with who? Christ. Paul said it. He said in, 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 in Galatians 2, 20, he said, I am what? Crucified with Christ. The life that I now live, it is not I who lives it, but Christ, the Son of God, who lives his life through me. I have been crucified with Christ. So my friends, your answer to the question we try to answer this morning will already tell whether your love will wax cold as the shaking intensifies. You already have the answer. The things that drive your life may be transient. They could be enduring. But if your effort is in the transient things, then you will fall into despair when they lose their value. But if your investment is in what endures, although you may be bruised, yet you will remain standing. Guys, somebody will say, Pastor Tony, it doesn't sound like you're normal. You mean that my life will pass? David saw it in Psalm 63. You know what he said? He says, your love is what? Better than life. I couldn't understand that as a new Christian. I said, I don't understand. Is there something better than life? Don't we all want to have life? Now, understanding that although my life may physically pass, if I have been crucified with Christ, I have life. Paul said, if you have been crucified with him, we will resurrect with him. Well, hear this. The psalmist in Psalm 102 tells us something very important. Verse 25 to 28 of Psalm 105. Excuse me. In the beginning, you, God, laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hand. They will perish. The heavens involved, the earth, the foundations, they will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you, God, will change them and they will be discarded. But you will remain the same. Your years will never end. And the children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. We don't have the time to break it down. If you are crucified with Christ, in spite of all the crazy things that will happen, to those factors, you will endure. Because the years of God don't change. He will not grow old. He will not grow weary. And therefore, the real answer to our question is not whether iniquity will multiply. The real question to our question is, are we investing in God? Are we being crucified? What shall a man give in replacement of his soul? Hear this. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciple, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Take those four factors I spoke about. Your life, your relevance. What else did I say? Freedom. Your, your freedom and your, your appetite. Put them all together. It is important. Deny them. Don't live by them. Let them live because of you. And when you leave, you don't have anything to lose. Why? For whoever wants to save their life will what? Lose it. But whoever loses their lives for me will what? Find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angel. And when and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Ultimately, the answer to all of these pains or the confusion that may strike man 
is to invest now in what is enduring. And that is the pursuit of God and his purposes. It is a safeguard against our love for God getting cold. Pursuit of God. And this will take us to our next topic because you know what? How do I pursue the God I do not know? Is it possible? No. So the first place to begin is to know God. So our next topic next week, if God permits us, is to know God. But I put it clearly like this. Tomorrow is not given to us. That's what Jesus says. Today is given to us. And I have to make sure that today I have gained it. I have won the battle over today. Because if it ends today, praise God, this body has served me well, but I want to see his face. I want to see his face. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. If he comes today, I hope we all see each other in the cloud. Amen? Amen. It will be such a relief. The battle will be done. I hope we can see him all together in the cloud. May the Lord bless you. Let us bow our